the most inferior representatives of humanity might hide their own crimes behind the words, I was merely following orders, presenting their counterfeit helplessness as a virtue and elevating cruelty to bravery. Our hero today never denied his own weakness nor attempted to justify himself with noble phrases. He did not love war, yet he fought. He detested torture, yet he inflicted it. He did not venerate the gods, yet he served their sacred purposes. He knew that after his death others would try to justify his actions as necessary obedience to orders, but he did not require it. It is time to learn the story of Argul Tal, a warrior, who first found the place where gods and mortals meet, the one whose discoveries the Imperium is doomed to remember. He was born in the small village of Sing Rook, lost amidst the hot sands of Colchis. His father was a carpenter, and was considered a calm and kind man. And his not-so-tall mother, from whom the boy inherited black hair, was a seamstress. The parents lived in a small hut made of straw and mud by the river, and could not even imagine the fate that awaited their youngest child. The name Argil Tal in the local dialect means the last angel. He was so named because the boy was the last child in the family. He had four older sisters who wept when their brother was chosen to become a future legionnaire. The youngest girl, Lakisha, gave Argil Tal a necklace which he wore on his wrist even decades after his elevation. The recruit himself could not understand his relative's suffering as he knew that there was no higher honour than to become an emperor's angel. To take Argil Tal into the legion, Erebus, who already then held the position of chaplain, came to his parents' home. The boy's mother asked the space marine to introduce himself before she handed over her son. Argil Tal later suspected that the courage and resilience were, to some extent, inherited from his mother, despite all the changes that occurred to him. The 17th Legion's base was located on Colchis. The children were not torn from their home planet. On the contrary, they were only more deeply immersed in the culture and existing beliefs. In the initial stages of training, ten-year-old Argel Tal was under the supervision of apothecary Turion, who monitored the implantation operations and the maturation of new organs. In addition, the Space Marine explained to the boy the phenomenon of the changes happening to him and mentally prepared him for the deadly trials. One of the first complex episodes in shaping the young recruit was meeting his own Primarch. The sight of Lorgar had such a strong impact on Argil Tal that he suffered from nightmares in confusion and pain for the following month. Turian claimed that the severe night visions were natural and would subside over time. Simply, the child's mind was not ready to behold the golden Primarch, and he needed time to get used to what he had seen. The eyes of a mortal were not meant to contemplate one who, in the apothecary's opinion, was the son of God. The image of Lorgar was imprinted in the boy's mind, causing pain every time he closed his eyes. However, the suffering melded within his soul with an unbearable desire to serve the Primarch. To become an Astartes, one had to endure many a harsh trial, but the image of the Primarch inspired the boy to earn the mantle of Space Marine at all costs. Turion, who visited the tiny cells of the parentless recruits in the evenings, remained in the memory of Argul Tal as a kind mentor. The apothecary monitored not only the physical, but also the spiritual state of the future Space Marines, instilling beliefs that would later form the foundation of many Legionnaires' personalities. Argul Tal was thankful to Turion for helping him undergo the most crucial transformation and ultimately become his true self. Even forty years after the apothecary's death, Argul Tal kept among his personal belongings a curved Xenos knife with which he had slit Turion's throat. Some of his battle brothers considered such a habit a sign of an unhealthy mind. However, their reproaches did not impact the collection of other weapons that had slain space marines close to Argul Tal. Erebus, the first to see the potential in the future Astartes for a warrior, intended to train his protégé into a chaplain. Many of Argul Tal's battle brothers claimed to see him as possessing a philosophical mind and correct speech. However, the warrior himself flatly refused the role of chaplain. It is known that during his training, a conflict arose between Argul Tal and Erebus, the reasons for which were not even disclosed to Lorgar. 
It is assumed that Erebus revealed something shocking to his pupil, and he decided never to interact with his mentor again, distancing himself as much as the limits of the Legion allowed. The true reason for such behavior remains unknown. However, recalling Erebus's abilities, it can be speculated that the chaplain, who never ceased communicating with the ruinous powers, introduced his philosophy to his pupil sooner than he should have. They both believed that on the night of the fateful argument, the first ever murder of an Astartes by a battle brother could have occurred. Perhaps if not for the disagreements with Erebus, Argal Tal might have been among the most distinguished chaplains. His conviction and devotion to Lorgar always resulted in fiery speeches, often exceeding in persuasiveness even those of active chaplains. But the warrior's talents were not limited to eloquence. Shortly after his elevation, Argal Tal took the position of chaplain of the Seventh Company of the Serrated Sun Chapter, thus becoming the youngest warrior in the history of the region's to hold a leadership position. However, personal achievements did not make him arrogant. Argal Tal skillfully found common ground with the mortal participants of the expedition and appeared friendlier than any other space marine. According to witnesses, after his elevation, he did not lose his humanity and perhaps for this reason was able to understand people well. The warrior's openness subsequently allowed him to forge friendships with the Astartes of brotherly legions and even with the Custodes. Argaltal's closest friend and brother-in-arms was Khan, the captain of the 8th Assault Company of the World Eaters, who, despite significant differences in their characters, also held the word-bearer in high regard. Throughout more than 60 years of the Great Crusade, the Serrated Sun chapter engaged in the liberation of the galaxy from Xenos and along with their brothers, spread the doctrine of Lorgar about the divinity of the Emperor. In that period, Argal Tal fought with two blades made of red iron, demonstrating high skills as a swordsman capable of controlling both blades simultaneously. His armor was gray and lenses blue, just like the eyes of the warrior himself. Any native of Colchis or worlds brought to compliance by the Seventeen Legion grew up confident that the master of mankind is a god, his sons, demigods, and the space marines, angels. This was the truth and the creed of life for any word-bearer, Astartes. Therefore, the news about the destruction of the city Monarchia on the planet Kur came as a surprise blow to the Legion. The Imperial forces did not directly inform Lorgar of the incident. Instead, they allowed the inhabitants of Kur to send a plea for salvation to the Word Bearer's fleet. It took the 17 Legion's ships two months of swift flight to reach the devastated planet. All this time, the Ultramarines awaited the arrival of their brethren in orbit. Argal Tal suspected that no explanations could ease the Primarch's grief. However, he was most interested in getting answers. The treacherous destruction of a peaceful planet by a brotherly legion could not have happened without reason, and Argal Tal wanted to find out why. Therefore, he was the first captain to respond to Roboot Gilliman's order to land on the surface. The title allowed him to be among the high ranks of the Legion, located not far from Lorgar himself. The warrior could see with his own eyes the unfolding scene of censure. Primarch Gilliman, together with Malkador, attempted to explain to Lorgar that his teachings and all the cultural peculiarities spread on the conquered planets contradicted the Imperial truth. For the Primarch of the Word-Bearers, as well as for all his Space Marines, such a statement was unthinkable. The Seventeen Legion spent colossal forces and resources on spreading the faith in the Emperor. Sometimes entire planets were destroyed for refusing to accept the proper faith. Now, however, the Sigilite was claiming that all this was not only in vain, but criminal. The Word-Bearers, recruited from religious societies, and even more immersed in faith after their elevation, could not comprehend what was said. All the goals for which they fought suddenly turned out to be false. Lorgar was unwilling to believe the words of a mortal and entered into conflict, after which the Emperor himself teleported to the surface. With a mental command, the Master of Mankind brought all 100,000 word-bearers to their knees. At this moment, Argal Tal was trying to convince himself that this posture was not at all humiliating. 
for it was assumed during sacred rites and in showing respect. However, his muscles moved against his will and his heart refused to obey. Like all his battle brothers, Argul Tal felt that, kneeling before the Emperor, he did not bow to him as a lord, but complied as if a slave. But the word-bearers' space marines were full of humility. What could offend many other legions did not hurt their pride. However, when the Emperor ordered to kneel Lorgar, and for the regular Astartes of the Ultramarines to rise, Argul Tal felt a furious rage. The captain was outraged that his Primarch was forced to endure such humiliations, especially in the presence of another legion. As if the destruction of Monarchia and the hundreds of thousands of its inhabitants were not enough. The Emperor declared the word-bearers the only legion that had disappointed him. Others, even less numerous forces, conquered planets much more effectively. Whereas the Seventeen Legion wasted resources on the imposition of beliefs. After expressing all the words of reprimand, the Emperor enveloped Lorgar with an unseen energy, from which the Primarch fell to his knees a second time, and blood appeared from his ears. Then the Master of Mankind left Kerr, leaving the word-bearers alone with those who had destroyed their perfect city. Argul Tal was the first of all to get to his feet and attempted to lead Lorgar away from the gaze of the Ultramarines. The Primarch cried out in despair to the heavens, and the captain did not want outsiders to witness this scene. However, when Gilliman announced the Emperor's last directive, Argul Tal could not contain his emotions and winced at the anticipation of his Primarch's rage. The word-bearer's legion was assigned twenty warriors of the Adeptus Custodes, whose mission was to observe and report back to Terra. An enraged Lorgar lunged at Gilliman, striking him in the breastplate. No fight ensued, although the word-bearers, like the Ultramarines, raised their bolters. Later, Argultal confessed that he gave the order not to shoot, only out of necessity. In truth, he wished for a shot to be fired and for the Ultramarines to pay for the humiliation wrought. However, Lorgar's anger turned to a sense of shame and he commanded the Seventeen Legion to retreat to the transport shuttles. Already aboard, Argul Tal noticed movement on the surface, despite the instruments indicating no sign of life. The Space Marine halted the transportation and returned to the surface to find out who he had seen. Making his way to the slopes of the nearest craters, the captain discovered a woman who turned out to be the sole inhabitant of Monarchia, having survived the attack by the Ultramarines, Exhausted, blinded, barely dragging her feet, she nevertheless continued towards some purpose known only to her. A fateful coincidence or destiny led the woman to the place where she was noticed by Argul Tal. Eventually, the woman discovered by the captain would become known as Blessed Lady Cyrene Valantion. At that moment, no one could imagine that a woman dying from exhaustion, whose legs were likely facing amputation, would acquire the glory of a living martyr and confessor of the Seventeen Legion. The cultures of Kur and Monarchia were not sufficiently reflected in Imperial sources. However, from the fragments available, it can be gleaned that before the tragedy, Cyrene Valantion fulfilled the role of a priestess of Shul Asher. Considering that Lorgar called Monarchia the ideal city, it is logical to presume a connection between the activities of the priestesses and the cult of the Emperor. Yet, there is no confirmation of this theory. The Shul Asher wore red garments made of simple fabric, and touching the cult's very ministers themselves was considered blasphemous. It is highly likely that their role in the society of Monarchia was also connected to providing moral support, as Cyrene Valantion possessed eloquent speech and skills in dealing with those in difficult situations. This, along with the girl's blindness, which occurred as a result of the city's bombardment, made her the ideal interlocutor for Astartes, who found themselves perplexed after the Emperor's reprimand. In the two weeks that the fleet aimlessly lingered in orbit, Argul Tal visited Cyrene Valantion three times and shared his thoughts with her. The girl's questions seemed naive to the captain. However, she asked precisely what he himself did not want to think about. Cyrene led the Space Marine to realize that the burning of Monarchia provoked not sorrow in him, but hatred. 
and most terrifyingly, after the conversation with the woman, Argel Tal allowed himself to think for the first time that he might be capable of hating the Emperor. Cyrene's words irritated him, but, left alone with himself, the captain could not deny the obvious. Everything he had fought for turned out to be a lie, and he had no new cause ahead. In rescuing Cyrene Valantian from the devastated planet, the captain saw in her the living embodiment of what could happen if the Legion were to face failure. However, the woman did not give up. Instead, she became stronger and learned to live anew, flatly refusing the implantation of augmetic eyes. She did not become a symbol of failure. On the contrary, she gained the fame of someone who was able to survive the terrible, and thus was marked by divine blessing. Perhaps the Seventeen Legion and Serena Valantion were destined to change and learn to live in a new reality. It was precisely what would constitute the renewed word-bearers that Lorgar spoke of soon after breaking his days-long isolation. Fighting for the Imperium in the Great Crusade, Argel Tal had never doubted the righteousness of his cause. Defending humanity and annihilating all who refused to accept the Imperial truth seemed to the captain to be inseparable. He did not entertain the thought that some civilizations had the right to live if they were not inherently hostile. Their very existence posed a threat. The righteousness of the Imperium, in Argel Tal's opinion, lay in its might. The culture of the state born on terror succeeded where others had failed, and this in itself was proof that the Imperium was on the right path. Countless Xeno species were to be destroyed in principle, and other human civilizations doomed themselves by refusing to join. This was just for as the Imperial Truth and Lorgar himself declared, cultures long severed from terror either fall into decline, unable to sustain their own advancement, or in their arrogance create technologies that also lead to their downfall. Thus, the mission of the Imperial forces was to subjugate the lost fragments of humanity or to destroy them before they could become a heretical threat. Argel Tal was always firm in his beliefs, but the tragedy at Monarchia shook his confidence. Like other word-bearers, the captain needed an idea for which he could give his life. Everything changed after the battle on a planet inhabited by a human civilization that did not wish to become part of the Imperium. The people of this world lived in cities made up of tall crystal towers, and their protectors were intelligent robots made of diamonds and obsidian. The battle proved so arduous that the Adeptus Mechanicus Automata and even several Custodes warriors came to the aid of the word-bearers. Fighting together, the Imperial forces achieved victory, but the Primarch insisted on celebrating the triumph solely with the Space Marines. Contrary to the Custodes' demand to oversee everything, as the Emperor had wished, Lorgar bluntly sent the observers back to their ships. The Primarch spoke of an ancient faith in a pilgrimage, of an idea to find a place where mortals could meet the gods. Lorgar decided to start this grand journey from Colchis. Nearly seven decades later, Argel Tal had the chance to return home. The transition took four months, during which the captain immersed himself in the philosophy of the old faith conversed with Cyrene Valantion and regularly took part in the training cage against Custodian Aquillon. Like other Emperor's bodyguards, the Custodians was not predisposed to brotherhood or friendship, but he was a formidable opponent, and Argel Tal admitted that there existed a mutual respect between them. The desire to follow Lorgar's ideas occupied the captain's soul. Although at times he felt guilty, for no longer taking part in the expedition. Reading reports of the Legion's failures within the Imperial Army, Argel Tal felt discomfort, knowing that the presence of his Seventh Company could have changed the outcome of battles. But the Serrated Sun chapter was obliged to support the Primarch in all his endeavours. Argel Tal's first task after returning to Colchis was to accompany Cyrene Valantion to a meeting with Lorgar. The situation was complicated by rumours that had spread after the tragedy at Kur, which had made Cyrene a saintly martyr in the eyes of the common people. The inhabitants of Colchis, who had been raised for millennia under theocratic rule, considered the woman blessed with divine grace and wanted to touch her in a superstitious hope of obtaining luck. Explaining to Cyrene her significance to the people, Argel Tal confessed that he himself held a religious reverence for her. 
In the period between the burning of Monarchia and the proclamation of the new creed, only Serene Valantion helped Argiltal and some other space marines not to lose their life's direction. However, after meeting with the Primarch, the woman's role became even more prominent. Moving through the square in the center of the capital, the Astartes, according to long-established tradition, shared scrolls from their armor with the joyous citizens. People considered receiving such a parchment a blessing and surrounded the warriors with a multitude of thousands. The mortal woman to whom Argiltal gave his scroll informed the captain that from that day onwards she would name her son after him. The space marine was embarrassed by such an honor but wished the woman and her infant luck. At the meeting with the Primarch, Cyrene Valantion was given permission to become the confessor of the Legion and to travel with the serrated sun chapter. Yet the woman was not the only reminder of Monarchia. The Primarch told Argiltal that he was grateful to him for his help, as it was the captain who first rushed to raise the father from the ashes of the burnt city. According to the Primarch, Corferon lied as if he did not remember the name of Argiltal. However, Erebus remembered him. This news greatly surprised the captain, as he thought that the first chaplain still harboured hatred for him due to past disagreements. However, facts indicated otherwise. Though Argul Tal himself was not about to forgive Erebus for what their paths had once diverged over. In addition, Lorgar declared that it was the Serrated Sun Chapter and its flagship De Profundis that had the honour of becoming a sanctuary for the Primarch, who did not want to be found. For the next three years, the word-bearers, divided into several expeditions, fought on various fronts of the Great Crusade. The Legion was replenished with new recruits at an unprecedented pace and fought with the highest efficiency, but the successes were merely a cover for Lorgar's true goal. While units led by Erebus and Corferon brought new worlds into compliance, the Primarch, along with Argil Tal, was engaged in the search for the truth. The final stop of the journey of De Profundis was Cardia. At that time, the world was populated by wild tribes. Astropaths and the Primarch heard voices emanating from the planet that called Lorgar by name. To the modern researcher, it may seem that Cardia, albeit remote but a known world, was always close to the main regions of the Empire, However, in the times of the 30th millennium, this was not the case. Being in orbit around Cardia, Argil Tal was shocked by the fact that it was at least a light year's journey to the nearest Imperial fleet. The inhabited borders of the Imperium were even farther. Lorgar became the Primarch who led his ships as deep into the unknown space as no one before him had. Behind Cadia raged a massive warp storm which was soon to become known throughout the galaxy as the Eye of Terror. During that period, no one could have predicted that it was the warp rift, rather than the planet itself, that constituted the final destination in the search for truth. Cadia turned out to be a world of paradisical nature. However, its green forests and warm coastal regions did not attract the local inhabitants. The wild tribes dwelled in the rocky wastelands, much to the surprise of the word-bearers and the custodes accompanying them. The fact that the speech and primitive writing of the natives were understandable to the natives of Colchis was somewhat alarming. Yet Argil Tal convinced himself that what was happening was normal, because he wished success for Lorgar in his quest for truth. The closer the Primarch got to the savages and the more strange coincidences were revealed, the stronger Argil Tal's fears grew. The Custodes, who could not understand the speech of the natives and deemed it necessary to exterminate the local tribes as soon as possible, heightened these apprehensions. The opinion of the Emperor's bodyguards was based on the fact that the locals, who had violet eyes, were either mutants or people corrupted by the warp. Therefore, they posed a threat. Argil Tal, however, was convinced that it was necessary first to find out the truth and only then proceed to the slaughter. The word-bearers spent several weeks among the primitive huts of the Aborigines. During this time, many other tribes flocked to their landing site, following the instructions of the shamans. It took considerable effort for Argil Tal to mollify the anger of the custodes, who were outraged by Lorgar's behavior. 
The captain was the only one among the Astartes who managed to earn the respect of the custodians, and they listened to his words, despite their distaste for the savages' customs. Since landing on Cadia, Lorgar had spent time in the company of a local woman, Ingathor. She interacted with the Primarch without fear and coordinated the movement of the Aborigines. The woman promised Lorgar Aurelian answers, but to receive them, the Primarch had to participate in the mandatory ritual. Lorgar feigned indifference to the announced ceremony and tried to demonstrate only scientific interest. However, even this was enough to anger the Custodes. The Emperor's bodyguards insisted that these superstitions did not warrant consideration, and encouraging such actions was yet another crime of Lorgar. No one but Argul Tal tried to calm the Custodes. On the contrary, some word-bearers incited philosophical disputes about religion, ending with the Custodes leaving the room to avoid starting a fight. But sometimes Argul Tal's patience ran out, and he harshly responded to his new comrades, whose blindness did not allow them to see the great prospects of Lorgar's plan. However, on the night when Ingathil promised to explain who was calling out the Primarch's name from the warp storm, Argul Tal's conviction in his father's righteousness wavered. Along with the custodian Vendatha, the captain arrived in a cave where Lorgar was observing the pagan ritual. Nine human victims were impaled on stakes, while the naked Ingathil danced beside them. Argil Tal noticed Colchician runes on the woman's body, as well as the emblem of the Serrated Sun chapter. Yet this did not mitigate the nightmarish reality unfolding before them. Like the custodian, the captain believed it was necessary to halt the ritual and could not comprehend why the Primarch remained inactive. To Argul Tal's and the other present Space Marines' surprise, Lorgar did not intend to interrupt Ingathil as he was fervently seeking answers. Even the bloody sacrifices did not disturb the Primarch. He saw them as a reflection of what the Covenant on Colchis had done several decades ago. Vendatha, unlike the word-bearers unbound by respect for the Primarch, attempted to arrest Lorgar and bring him before the Emperor's judgment. However, nothing could deter the Primarch from obtaining the answers he sought. In the ensuing struggle, the Custodian killed three Space Marines, including the Master of the Serrated Sun chapter, and turned his weapon against the Primarch, after which he was severely wounded by Argul Tal. One of the Battle Brothers commended the Captain for his dexterity. The Captain could not help but defend the Primarch, yet the killing of the Custodian seemed to him a monstrous crime. Nevertheless, the nightmare did not end there. Ingathil convinced Lorgar to impale the dying Vendatha, making him the tenth offering for the ritual. Horrified by his brother's actions, Argiltal declared that no answers were worth such sacrifices. Like other natives of Colchis, the captain was not devoid of religious upbringing, especially conviction in Lorgar's righteousness. Yet he saw a line between faith and madness. Until that day, Argul Tal had justified all of Lorgar's unjust or strange orders as being influenced by Corferon or Erebus, but now the objective circumstances showed that the Primarch could be mistaken independently. That's why Argul Tal desperately tried to shield the dying Vendatha with his own body, preventing his torturous death. Lorgar ordered his son to step aside or take his place beside the custodian on an eleventh stake. The rite concluded with the transformation of the woman Ingathil the Chosen into the demon Ingathil the Ascended. The monstrous creature, the mere sight of which induced nausea, promised Lorgar answers in exchange for the lives of his sons. Ingathil the Ascended made no secret of the harm it would cause the Space Marines. Nonetheless, Lorgar was undeterred. Listening to the conversation between the Primarch and the demon with horror, Argul Tal realized that Lorgar would sacrifice them in his quest for truth. The demon Ingathil the Ascended promised to guide the word-bearers to a place where gods and mortals meet. The first space marines upon whom the Primarch decided to impose this burden were the Serrated Sun chapter. The ship's crew was warned not to look at the mysterious guide. Yet even the mere presence of the demon aboard was enough to drive the crew to madness. Their suffering, however, was short-lived. Soon after the ship entered the Eye of Terror, the mortals on board perished. The demon revealed to Argil Tal and the entire Order the history of the Eye of Terror's emergence 
and uncovered the reasons why the warp, called by him Chaos, invaded real space. The Astartes of the Serrated Sun Chapter witnessed the fall of the Elder, but the Xenos' mistakes seemed to argle Tal to be flaws of their race, not something humanity could commit. Ingethil the Ascended, however, claimed that humans would repeat the Elder's fate and also destroy their own civilization. The demon cited the Emperor, who in his quest for power, formed an alliance with the Chaos Gods and created the Primarchs with their aid. To substantiate his claims, Ingethil the Ascended sent Argol Tal and his brothers to the Emperor's laboratories, where the Astartes were able to see the infant Primarchs in their incubation capsules. There, the demon spoke of the imperfections in the work on the gene seed and reminded them of the legions suffering from defects. Everyone was aware of issues like those of the Thousand Sons or the Imperial Fists, whose peculiarity lay in the malfunctioning of the Betcher's gland. But Ingethil the Ascended contended that errors had affected the gene seed of every legion. According to the demon whom Argol Tal was ordered not to believe, flaws in the word bearer's gene code stimulated certain chemical processes in the brain. Because of this, part of Lorgar's sons unwaveringly trusted every word of their father. Naturally, warriors of all legions loyally served their own Primarchs, but none of them defended the righteousness of their fathers with such conviction and fervor. Argol Tal refused to agree with the demon, though he recalled episodes that could prove such a flaw. During joint missions with the Lunar Wolves, Thousand Suns, Ultramarines and the Word Bearers, the Raven Guard casually noticed in the eyes of brothers from other legions a disdain caused by discontent with too severe a purge of pagans. The wrath of Lorgar's sons turned out to be overly fanatical and targeted even by Astartes' standards. Argol Tal, like other space marines, was confident that the Primarchs were scattered across the galaxy due to tragic chance. But what Ingethil uncovered pointed to years of Imperial propaganda lies. The dogmas denied the existence of gods and demanded punishment for any superstition. However, the capsules with the Emperor's sons were inscribed with prayers and spells, and the laboratory itself was protected by the most powerful Geller field. According to the demon, this was connected to the truth, the true fathers of the Primarchs, the Dark Gods. The entities that gave the Emperor the power and wisdom to create sons were deceived. The Master of Mankind betrayed those with whom he made the deal, did not want to return the Primarchs, and, expecting the wrath of the gods, tried to shield himself from them with a Geller field. Argil Tal understood that the time when the demon brought them to the laboratory was not chosen by chance. The very catastrophe was supposed to occur in the eyes of the word-bearers. But even forces as mighty as these required assistance to break through the psychic barrier. Then, the captain of the Seventh Company of the Serrated Sun Chapter drew his dual blades of red iron and struck the field generator. The protection of the Primarch's incubation capsules was destroyed. Streams of energy, as well as the Emperor himself, burst into the laboratory. The warp currents carried the sons of the Master of Mankind to different parts of the galaxy, while Argol Tal's squad returned aboard the Orpheo's Lament. The demon insisted that the Geller field was a barrier between those who bear the word and the desired truth. The example of what happened in the Emperor's laboratory was meant to convince Argol Tal of the demon's honesty. Yet the Space Marine understood that to lose the field meant to perish. Devotion to Lorgar and the desire to actualize his ideas triumphed. Realizing the full risk, Argol Tal ordered the destruction of the Geller field generator. A hundred Astartes were instantly attacked by a force they did not even have the chance to see. Ingethil the Ascended struck down one space marine after another, depriving them of life and proclaiming the arrival of others like itself. Argol Tal felt as though both his hearts were torn apart and something cold and foreign invaded his body. The warrior died, but the last thing he managed to see before death was a fallen chaplain of the Order, now rising from the dead. When Argil Tal opened his eyes again, all his brothers were already on their feet. They did not feel as before, but they were whole, and their hearts beat once more. All the Space Marines remembered the horrors of death and discussed them with each other. However, 
they found no explanation for what had happened. Argeltal felt as if hundreds of parasites writhed in his veins and someone else was looking at the world through his eye sockets. Yet the captain was alive, and that meant he bore responsibility for his battle brothers. The mortal crew of the Orpheus Lament wasn't merely killed, but exsanguinated. Three space marines never awoke from death. Ingethel the Ascended insisted that the nightmare beyond the porthole was the truth. Argeltal was sure that Lorgar did not understand what fate he was consigning his sons to by agreeing with the demon. However, the captain remembered his supposed genetically ingrained loyalty and now did not know if he could have disbelieved the Primarch had he truly lied to his face. Over the following seven months, the surviving space marines fought for existence aboard the ship adrift in the warp. Supplies and water were spoiled, so the only way to quench their hunger was the desiccated bodies of the crew and less fortunate battle brothers. The Astartes fought, attempting to drink each other's blood. They killed the weakest and consumed their flesh. Months of real hell stretched unbearably long, and in the end, only 37 warriors remained alive. When the Orpheus Lament managed to escape the warp and was picked up by the De Profundis, extremely emaciated sons stood before Lorgar, almost having lost hope for salvation. Argultal was happy to learn that the father had been waiting for his return from the Eye of Terror all this time. However, in real space, the absence of the Orpheus Lament had lasted for less than a minute. To obtain a long-awaited answer, Lorgar questioned Argel Tal and what was heard, as the Primarch had anticipated, changed the galaxy forever. The man who had been a captain throughout his life harbored doubts about the necessity of unveiling the truth. Even standing at the capsules of the infant Primarchs, Argel Tal was not entirely convinced that humanity was ready to hear the harsh truth. However, now before Lorgar stood a son, who had undergone unique transformations, at first glance, a barely noticeable difference manifested over the course of the conversation, and the Primarch realized those who survived on the Orpheus' lament would never be the same, just like the Imperium, whose fate was altered by the truth they uncovered. Recounting his adventures, Argeltal several times defied Lorgar, spoke disdainfully of the higher captains of the Legion, and laughed with two voices. The enlightened Primarch guessed that now another soul lived within his son's body, but did not understand its nature and demanded the space marine to control himself. In this conversation, as in the near future, Argil Tal had to confront the entity residing within him and try to wrest control of his body from the Neverborn. The captain told Lorgar that according to the demon, the real changes would occur with him and the other warriors of the Serrated Sun chapter, when the galaxy would be ablaze with fire. But the space marine was so shaken by the journey into the Eye of Terror that he lost all his own memories and did not know if this time had already begun. After conversing with his father, Argel Tal came to his senses. However, the feeling, which he himself identified as fear, did not disappear. The presence of another in his body frightened the captain so much that he was ready to utter his final words. But the Primarch ordered him to wait for the end of the story. Until the moment of full transformation or evolution, Argil Tal, along with the other survivors from the Serrated Sun chapter, had to hide their peculiarities from all outsiders, including the Custodes. Immediately after speaking with Lorgar, the captain went to the Confessor, who expected to hear a story of repentance for the dozens of brothers killed aboard the Orpheus' lament. Knowing what had happened, Cyrene Valantion believed that it was precisely the guilt over the slaughter of other space marines that brought Argultal so quickly. However, the warrior wished to repent, not for that. Now, as the word-bearers had learned of the existence of the Dark Gods, and that they had fought for false ideals for over a hundred years, the captain's perception of righteousness changed. He remembered the planets where populations were exterminated for embracing the same truths he now shared, and he felt guilty. The thought of the years wasted in vain where he, risking himself, fervently fought for a falsehood, oppressed the warrior. As before, Argeltal intended to keep fighting for the future of humanity, but now he did not want to risk himself for an imperium founded on deception. Soon after returning from the Eye of Terror, the Serrated Sun, Chapter went through a ceremony, 
in which Argal Tal was appointed the new master. Those warriors who had overcome months of trials aboard the Orpheo's Lament received the title Gal Vorbach, the Blessed Sons. The elite unit donned red armor, starkly standing out against the backdrop of the Grey Legion. But one of the visor lenses was also adorned with the serrated sun. Argaltal continued joint training with custodian Aquilon, who, although suspecting strange changes in the space marine, nevertheless believed his lie about the death of Vendatha. Their duels still ended in Argaltal's defeat, but with time a barely noticeable difference began to emerge in his actions, becoming more distinct. Aquilon believed the vague explanations for the death of the brother because he considered the new master of the serrated son. Chapter the only word-bearer worthy of trust. Argaltal felt changes he couldn't explain even to himself. Sometimes he had the urge to curse the interlocutor in an unknown language. In the presence of Cyrene Valantion, he thought about how wonderful it would be to consume the woman. But these minor details didn't form a coherent picture for almost fifty years. Only in the last battle together with the custodians, preceding the Battle of Istvan V, did the Galvorbach feel the full extent of their changes. Every warrior in the unit felt weakness and almost lost consciousness during the battle. Then came a period of alien Astartes debilitating weakness. Argal Tal felt nausea in the presence of an outsider and even something resembling fear. His body fluctuated between hot and cold and the armor acquired sensitivity as if it were native skin. To test this, the space marine cut himself and saw how the hole in the armor closed up with a scar as if it were a wound. The leader of the Galvorbach was sure that he was dying. But he could not show his condition to the custodians, therefore he sought refuge in the chambers of the Confessor, where he spent three nights in a form that reminded him of what he was destined to become. The warrior's helmet no longer came off, the face shield acquired the ability to mimic and feel, claws appeared on the gauntlets. But after three days, the alien part of the armor disappeared. Argaltal was himself again, except he could no longer remove his armor and helmet. Along with the other warriors of the Gal Vorbach, he returned to his duties, claiming that the warriors of the unit had been occupied with meditation. Over fifty years, Argaltal became even closer to Aquilon, trusting and telling him perhaps more than even to the Confessor. He understood that one day he would be forced to kill the comrade but continued to spend time with him, and even convinced the custodian to talk to Cyrene Valantion to grasp her significance to the Legion. The woman, who for decades had been listening to the secrets of the word-bearers, knew about the Primarch's plans, the new idea, and the imminent changes to the Imperium. But she did not know that her friend, Argal Tal, who valued the Confessor perhaps above all others, conducted torture of other mortals with indifferent calm. The custodians, noticing oddities in the Legion, could not help but report them to terror, but the messages were distorted by means of dark rituals. The chaplain of the serrated sun read prayers over the crucified astropaths, who had been tortured for weeks before the unfortunate souls perished from agonies and chaos-inflicted diseases. This dreadful process occurred under the watchful eyes of Argal Tal, who believed he was duty-bound to personally witness the evil committed by his command. In this manner, a total of 64 individuals were annihilated. On the eve of the battle at Istvan V, where the forces of Horus were to attack the Loyalists, the leader of the Gal Vorbach heard for the first time the entity that had slumbered within his body for five decades. Inside his consciousness spoke Rome, a demon claiming to have penetrated every cell. Recalling those unfortunate enough to become a vessel for the Neverborn, one remembers terrible images where humans are used as containers, maimed and die in excruciating pain. However, the Gal Vorbach did not suffer such a fate. Raum offered Argaltal a symbiosis, a partnership in equilibrium, alternating possession of their shared body. For many others, such a deal would have ended in deceit by the Neverborn with the gravest of outcomes. Yet, those who dwelled within the Galvorbach proved true to their word. During the battle at Istvan V, returning from the Eye of Terror, they allowed demons control for the first time. 
leading to the transformation of the word bearers into a form later seen in various battles across the galaxy. Argul Tal once again felt his armor as his own skin, his legs turned into hooves, leathery wings burst from his back, and horns sprouted from his helmet. In such a form, the warrior was much stronger than regular space marines, whom he could easily tear apart with his claws. All the Gal Vorbach underwent a similar change. Their armors were covered in spikes and growths, their heads in helmets turned into monstrous moors, weapons fused with their arms. However, even this increased power did not guarantee invulnerability in battle. The Raven Guard at Istvan V managed to destroy one of the Gal Vorbach using a flamethrower. Argul Tal felt the death of a comrade from another part of the battlefield. Raum shared in this loss as well. It is believed that the Gal Vorbach were in symbiosis, not with different demons but with one, divided into several fragments. However, no evidence supports this claim. Argul Tal monitored the battle from the depths of his own body, while Raum occupied the dominant consciousness. Decades of silent acclimatization to one another made the exchange of roles a simplest process. Gaining freedom of action, the Neverborn reveled in battle, drank the blood of enemies, and devoured their flesh. Raum enhanced even the lightest strikes of Argul Tal, turning a mere attempt to grasp an enemy into tearing off limbs. The demon intentionally caused as much suffering to the opponents as possible, and reveled in these emotions, becoming increasingly ferocious. But the more Raum feasted, and the closer victory loomed, the more distinctly Argul Tal felt the consciousness of the Neverborn slipping away. When the battle concluded, the satisfied demon returned to its slumber, and control over the body was returned to the Space Marine. After a period of uncharacteristic desires and bloodlust, Argul Tal felt used, drained and very tired. However, he was content. The union with the demon had stabilized to such an extent that the Space Marine once again regained the ability to remove his helmet and armor. The warrior no longer felt anxious about the fact that his body was sometimes controlled by an alien entity. An equilibrium had been established between the first generation of the Gal Vorbach and the Neverborn. The Battle of Istvan V ended with a victory for the Chaos Forces. But in orbit, Argul Tal awaited a new challenge. Custodian Aquilon discovered a sanctuary where astropaths were being tortured and surmised the scale of the betrayal. Since the Legion was on the surface, the custodians went with questions for the Confessor, who they believed was informed about everything. Aquilon destroyed the tech priest protecting the Confessor and his automaton, then fatally wounded the woman herself. Rushing aboard the De Profundis, Argul Tal vainly tried to awaken Raum to gain strength suitable for defeating the Custodes, but the tired demon did not wish to wake. In the fierce battle, Aquilon and two of his brethren were killed at the cost of several word-bearers, and Raum came into activity only after sensing the scent of Cyrene Valantion's blood spilled on the floor. The woman died in the arms of Argul Tal, and despite her loyalty to the Legion, condemned the warrior's transformation into what he had become in symbiosis with the demon, with her dying breath. Of the day he lost the confessor whom he had protected for decades, and a companion with whom he had spent many battles and long conversations, Argil Tal retained an electronic tablet with the farewell writings of Cyrene Valantion and Aquilon's golden sword. It is widely known that the weapons of the Custodes are genetically programmed to work only in the hands of their owner. However, Argil Tal found a secret way to hack this system. He fought with Aquilon's sword in hundreds of battles, never revealing how he managed to activate it. Every time he drew the weapon that ended the life of the Confessor, Argil Tal wanted to break it and throw it away, but restrained himself. For such a reminder of his own failure was supposed to also be part of the punishment for it. However, Aquilon's blade was not the first such weapon in Argul Tal's collection. It is commonly believed that the leader of the Gal Vorbach received the unofficial title Crimson Lord in the early years of the heresy. However, according to the testimony of Chroniclers of the Seventeen Legion, such a name appeared immediately after the transformation of the Serrated Sun chapter and the change of armor to Red. The drop site massacre undermined the Order's strength, leaving only a few dozen fighters from it. 
Then Argul Tal requested the Primarch to create a new union from among the survivors. The unit named Vakrajal, the chapter of consecrated iron, replaced the serrated sun chapter, becoming a symbol of the Legion's rebirth and transformation. During the Shadow Crusade in Ultramar, Argel Tal took his place among Lorgar's trusted officers alongside Erebus and Kor Pharon. Unlike the other two, however, he managed to prove his sincere devotion to the Primarch and was thus called his most beloved son. Aurelian regretted having sent Argel Tal into the Eye of Terror before venturing there himself. In his view, the Space Marine never became what he was destined to be, being broken by the guilt of not preventing or causing the death of those close to him. Yet, the Primarch was mistaken. Argel Tal and Raum learned to interact harmoniously and trust each other. The Neverborn called the Space Marine a brother, truly cared for his well-being, and even predicted their common death supposedly destined to occur in the shadow of Great Wings. For a time, Vakra Jal was aboard on the flagship Conqueror, and Argil Tal met with Khan again. Despite their friendship, the warriors disagreed on many issues, including faith, their views on Primarchs, and methods of warfare. Argil Tal disliked the recklessness with which Khan went into battle without a thought for survival. The World Eater, in turn, condemned the ritualistic torture of enemies. It wasn't the act of cruelty itself he objected to, but the purposes and the dark sorcery it entailed, which seemed blasphemous to Khan. Nevertheless, the warriors were not just friends but brothers in arms, having endured not only severe trials together. They often fought in the arena of the Conqueror, chained together following the traditions of the World Eaters. Neither Argel Tal nor Khan saw duels with battle brothers as a means to earn respect. Hence, they often lost to other pairs of opponents. Additionally, according to witnesses, both warriors had similar souls and a sense of humor, making them particularly close. Argel Tal trusted Khan infinitely, and thus asked him to participate in the abduction of Cyrene Valantion's remains from a group of cultists and in the subsequent resurrection of the woman. The idea did not come by itself. Argel Tal was approached by Erebus, who purportedly warned the warrior of the danger. As a skilled manipulator and liar, the first chaplain directed Argel Tal's thoughts so that he believed he had come up with the possibility of resurrecting the confessor himself. Shortly before this encounter, Lorgar had requested Argel Tal avoid interacting with Erebus. But the thought of possibly bringing Cyrene Valantion back silenced rationality. The warrior wanted too badly to rid himself of the feeling of guilt, and Ram's protests, calling Erebus a deceiver, went unnoticed. Argel Tal and Khan went after the confessor's remains. Afterward, they handed her body over to the first chaplain. The resurrection ritual appeared monstrous to the World Eater. Fifteen slaves shouted the names of demons, that might have encountered Cyrene in the warp, encountered, tortured, pursued, and devoured. In the next stage of the ceremony, mortals began to slam their heads against the table where the shrouded remains of the confessor lay. Watching the proceeding, Khan declared that nothing is worth such abomination. Unbeknownst to himself, the son of Angren echoed the words once spoken by Argel Tal during a ritual on Cadia. A new reality with the revealed truth altered the word-bearer's stance on religious rites and the price that must be paid for them. Eventually, all the slaves were dead and darkness shrouded the room. Soon footsteps and a woman's weeping were heard. Cyrene Valantian was resurrected and no longer blind. The burden of guilt for the death of the confessor no longer oppressed Argultal, allowing him to focus on the second part of Erebus's words about the supposed imminent demise of Khan. The leader of the Vakra Yal, previously considering his friend invulnerable, began to worry about the World Eater and monitor his movements during battles. During the battle on Nuceria, the homeworld of Primarch Angron, Argil Tal intentionally fought alongside Khan to protect him in case that very dangerous enemy appeared. The battle was particularly arduous, as their opponents were not only ultramarines, but also from time to time world eaters who had lost their minds from the butcher's nails. By the end of the fight, Argul Tal and Raum were as exhausted as never before. Even demonic physiology could not regenerate such a vast number of wounds simultaneously. 
Yet a weakened Argoltal was satisfied that he had managed to prevent Khan's death. After speaking with his friend, the leader of the Vakrajal remained atop a defeated titan where Erebus approached him. Argoltal tried to convince himself and Ram that the first chaplain could be trusted, for he had returned Cyrene Valantion and warned about Khan. But the demon disagreed and continued to call Erebus a deceiver. For years, the coexistence and even brotherhood between Argoltal and Raum had saved them both on multiple occasions. However, the Space Marine now disregarded the demon's wisdom. Taking advantage of the leader of the Vakrajal's fatigue, Erebus stabbed him in the back. The prophecy that the first chaplain had promised Khan was actually meant for Argoltal. The moment the strike was delivered, Raum vanished from the Space Marine's body, likely not just returning to the warp, but perishing completely due to the dagger's unique property. Argil Tal himself tried to keep fighting, although his body refused to move and his helmet and armor once again became mere ceramite. Seeing the strength of the dying man, Erebus expressed regret. Such a powerful warrior would have been useful in the battle for terror. However, according to the chaplain, Argoltal had doomed himself to death. For Khan, chosen by the gods and the future champion of chaos to ascend, it was necessary to reject everything human, and his friend from the word-bearers by his mere existence would have hindered this. With a battle brother at his side, Khan could not have fully transformed into a bloodthirsty berserker. In but one of the myriad possible futures, both warriors could have remained alive, yet in that singular probability, Argil Tal would have had to renounce the idea of reviving the Confessor. Up until the moment of his death, the leader of the Vakra Jal continued to stare, disbelieving in his own mortality, for Raum had proclaimed that they would perish in the shadow of colossal wings. It was then that Erebus stepped away from the prone space marine, revealing the Imperial Aquila atop the Titan. Argil Tal expended his energy to protect his comrade trusting in the deceiver's prophecy, and died precision. There was none nearby to thwart the treacherous strike to his back.